Oh, 15 minutes for white paper, because yeah, yeah. I'm waiting myself. Are you ready, though? Right, thank you very much. Um, I'm Daniel Kesson, I'm the RCT advisor at the British Museum, and I've got specific responsibility for the Portland Antiquities Scheme website and digital presence. Uh, many of you might know that the scheme exists, some of you might not. Who's not aware of the Portland Antiquities Scheme in this room? Not many people have put their hand up, so that's quite good for us to know. So, back in 1996, there was a chap called Tim Chadler Hall who was actually publishing lots of papers. <laughs> and he actually said this in the MDA Journal, which I think is still really relevant to what we're doing now. Many of our collections aren't ready to go on the internet. We're struggling for resources and funding, we don't know how to put things online. We're still trying to work out what to do. I think he's still spot on now. Many of us are still trying to work out what to do. Have you finished taking a picture, Tony? I have now. So, we've got to think in different ways, think outside the boxes. We've got to work out how we can get our resources online, and I think some of these papers are actually going to talk more about how things go online. Doug's talked about alternative ways of getting your message out there using the social media platform. <coughs> Other people talked about geocities and how that was a way of getting things out on the internet. Everything I do, I build myself apart from social media platforms, and that's because I've taught myself how to use the internet technology. So. Can you all have seen it? Mm -hmm. okay. The Port Antiquities web domain finds that all.uk was registered back in uh, March 1999. They then got money from the HLF. Now, Bob and uh, Aretha are gone. They might want to know what we actually did for that money. Now, we had £150,000 dedicated to putting the website online. And David Dawson is here, he's going to talk after this. He was actually quite instrumental in what happened with that website. It's developed a lot since that time. We started off with 33,000 objects online. We're now up to 820,000 objects 10 years later. It's amazing how much data we've actually managed to collect and put onto the website. Since 2006, I've been completely developing it myself. We haven't had funding to actually keep it going, and I've been finding ways of actually making sure the website works. The most recent iteration has just cost my salary costs and the cost for hosting. It's about £4,000 a year that I've now got to spend on hosting a website that serves a national audience. We're now getting nearly half a million visitors a year using our web resource. I'm going to show some stats later on about how our website usage has grown. We've got over 21,000 people now giving us information and contributing data towards our project. So it's a big crowdsourcing project. It's a crowdsourcing project in some ways, but it's not in many other ways. But everything we do at Port Antiquities Scheme digitally is geared towards public engagement. We want people to consume our data and actually interact with it. If we just sat there as a database of objects, it would be really interesting to some people, but useless to many others. And I think the fact that we've got half a million people using our website shows that we are finding a way of engaging with some of the public. It's only some of the public. It's about 66 million people live in this country, so half a million people using our website. Wow, it can make much of an impact, really. But we've got to let the public use our data. It's really important. It goes down an alleyway and just sits there. What's it there for? The Port Antiquity site has changed drastically over the last 10 years. So you can see a couple of pictures here of how it used to look. We also had a very fragmented resource. We had a website and we had a database. I decided to bring those two together and actually have everything on one side, everything integrated. I wanted to be able to pull content back into what I was building and reuse that information to enrich and enhance pages. So these are the last two iterations that I built after 2006. A bit clunky, it sort of shows how websites used to work. We're now moving towards this more Web 2.0 using something called Twitter Bootstrap for a layout. So I'm using open source tools to actually make my work easier to replicate and for other people to use my uh, code for their own websites. Now, I'm the only person who builds that site. We've got a big sustainability problem with the scheme. If I decide to leave, we're stuffed in many ways. But I've published all the codes, so someone with some skills in programming could come along and take my work, and perhaps use it. I'm also leveraging platforms that Doug talked about, but I'm only using a few. I haven't got time, as Doug said. We haven't got resources most of the time to actually use these uh, social platforms. So the big ones for me that I actually leverage are Flickr, YouTube, Facebook pulling content back into our website. I've got a whole module on the side of our Flickr pages. It's incredibly popular. Over 1.7 million people have viewed our uh, pages for Flickr. We also cater for a very different audience as well as most traditional museums. We segregated where people are using their postcode data they gave us when they volunteered information. We worked out 48% of our constituent body in the lowest social classes of Britain. Uh, the British Museum gets 18% of that class coming to see them. It does reflect where they are, and people might be from overseas as well, because the BM stats are very skewed. 
this slide just shows you how our visitor stats have gone up over the last few years. I'm quite pleased with these because we don't put much money into it and we've got a very small constituent audience. So 2007, we started with about 127,000 unique visitors a year. We're now up to nearly half a million this year. And I think we'll be about 550 by the end of the year. We also traditionally go up in spikes after, after the harvest has happened. So I'm using tools like Google Analytics. We need to actually look at our website and work out how things are being used. This gives you an idea of how the website's used over time. You can see spikes and dips. At the start of the week, we always get lots of visitors. People have been out there testing in fields and found objects. They come back online and look up objects online to work out what they might have. Towards Friday, it's dipped off. Saturday and Sunday, we get very few users. We get about 1,500, first users 3,000. I've also analyzed our stats to show where things happened. Now, there's quite a big spike in the middle. That's the for Britain going on TV. We've also got the uh, Crosby Garrett Hamlet being sold at Christie's. We had the record online, so that had a spike on our web stats. <coughs> so we're working out why things happen. We want to know whether people are coming to our website because of certain media events. I've also licensed our content quite openly. We're using a Creative Commons by uh, share alike license, which Pat, as a Wikipedia user, would actually quite like because it means all our content could go onto Wikipedia without any restriction. <coughs> we can't sell our images. We've worked out that no one's going to pay for them. If people do use our images, normally we say, can we have a copy of the publication? And that goes in the British Museum Library. We're just happy that someone's using our work. So we're quite liberal. It won't work for everyone. The HLF document actually cites that you should have a non-commercial clause on the Creative Commons on the new digital framework, which will suit many institutions, but we can't take our license back off. You can't revoke that license. One of the things I'm working on really hard at the moment is actually making sure our website's really optimised for search engines. And this gives you a graph of how our website's been indexed since the start of the year when I replaced it with a new version. We're now up to nearly 6 million URLs on our website indexed by Google. It's a hell of a lot of URLs. I don't even know I've got that many pages on our website. But they're actually indexing them, so we're getting very good search results. We're also serving very structured data. We use something called RDFA in our HTML markup, which points to all the resources. We're doing linked data. We're going to Wikipedia and putting information back into our website. I'm going out to uh, something called Pilates, which is a gazetteer of ancient places, and bring data from that site. All of this stuff has an impact on Google search engine rankings. By putting all this stuff into structured data, you get higher rankings on the, their search engine. So hopefully you get more people coming to visit your site. And this hasn't taken much effort, because me learning how to program the code to do this, it doesn't take very much, you just have to look on the internet and say, how do I do this? And it works. We spread our information freely around, like I mentioned Wikipedia earlier, so we've given the pictures and the stuff that you hoard. So that's enriched their pages. People see those images and come back to our website. So we're getting a kickback and putting information <coughs> in different sites. So objects like the Cosby Garrett helmet, the only actual uh, freely available image about a year ago was one that I took from the actual auction, which I gave to Wikipedia to use. This one belongs to Christie's, which is probably the nicest image, but you can't use that in any publication without paying them a fee. Our ones you can use for free. When the Staffordshire Hoard was announced, we got asked about two days before it launched if we could build a website. So I built this website with all the pictures which went into Flickr and were pulled back through the application program interface into that website. So we're allowing lots of people different access methods to this information. We have records on our database of each of these objects. We have all the pictures on Flickr. So if our website went down, they could still see the images and comment and annotate and do all sorts of stuff with them or reuse them on a different platform. And we also have them as a story on the entire website. Is it quite popular? So when I say quite popular, this gives you an idea of how it was used after it was launched. So you get a long term model. So people were very interested when it launched, and they die off, and then there's a few dips and blips. Uh, this is where they're back in the news about acquisition. So you can see how people are interested in certain things. The chart on the right gives you a, a view of how many people are looking at pages on the day that it went out. So 1.3 million pages were looked at on the day it launched. So I think that's quite a successful model for actually pushing information out to the public domain. And how much did I spend on that website? Have a guess. Zero pounds. I'm not saying everything you can do on the internet is free. It needs time and resource. Doug knows this. Pat knows this. It does take time and effort. So you invest your own time in. David knows this from working at Wilshire. He puts a lot of effort into getting their website to do certain things. So can we have an impact on the main street? Yes, you get some map cutting on the front page of the Telegraph. One of the big things we're working on now is trying to outsource our recording program to the public. 
it's a very big problem for the scheme that we don't have enough resources to record every single object that the public brings up in their hobbies. So what we try to do is broaden it to the members of the public who are interested in archaeology, you might be mesoscetrists, you might just be archaeology <coughs> students. We want them to help us get objects on, so we crowdsource information. I give them access to our website, and they can record an object. And at the moment, we have 51 individuals adding objects onto our database. And an average member of staff can do about 1,000 objects a year. It's not a lot of objects, really. It takes time. You have to research objects, you have to take photos, you have to do Photoshop, write long descriptions, and you have to geo-reference each object with a map reference and put it onto our database. But what we've managed to do this year is we've had enough people putting objects on to get nearly three new full-time equipment staff putting information on. It's been a big boon to our uh, finance agencies because they're actually seeing the information going on by the public, reduces their workload, we get more figures. And we're now producing an HLF bid uh, with Bob's help and advice. And we're trying to get 300 individuals actually recording objects. Not every one of those individuals will record 1,000 objects a year. If they do 10, it's still a big bonus for us. It aims to increase our capacity and alleviate the burden on people. So there's going to be other papers this afternoon talking about crowdsourcing. Brad, who's uh, not on the programme, is going to talk about her. Crowdsourcing is a way of actually increasing people's access to archaeology. You can go out there and you can grab people who might have done cuneiform studies at university. We then think, actually, I'd like to get back into doing some of that work. Perhaps I can help out with the project. So I think Brad can talk more about that later on. I think some of the other papers this afternoon are going to talk about people's public um, appetite for archaeology. Lisa is going to be talking later on in the conference. She's going to talk about her Dick Ventures project. So there's all these projects out there that are trying to harness public activity to make their websites better or their digital activity better to talk on social platforms and do all sorts of new things that are innovative. We're in a very good time for digital work. It's very inexpensive to do a lot of stuff, but it's the time that you invest into that work that is the expensive part. So that's all you're going to have from me. I'm going to move on to some of the other papers unless you have questions. Thank you very much.